made a TV movie in Tunisia. And a Tunisian TV crew shows up and says, uh, well, what else have you done? And I said, well, I wrote the show MacGyver. <gasps> you created MacGyver? And I said, yeah, why? What, what's the big... They went, you don't understand. This country stops when that show is on. I said, you're kidding me. They said, no, no. It turns out the same was true in South America. The same was true in some of the Norwegian countries. The same was true in some Asian countries. The same was true in Europe. The world would just stop when MacGyver was on. After that interview, I would walk down the street in Tunisia. Men would come out of their shops to shake my hand. Women would come up to me on the street with children and say, kiss this man. I said, what are you talking about? It's a television show. He said, it's MacGyver. Okay, it's MacGyver. It was like sacred to them. And I'm going, what is this? MacGyver is a child of mine, but I don't take credit for what it became because it grew up and did it all by itself. I just happen to be the father. Hello and welcome to the Ronnie Lever Show, where every week we bring you fascinating guests with inspiring stories of success and overcoming obstacles from the world of sports, business, and entertainment. To support this channel, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and hit the like button so that we can deliver you the best content possible. Having started his career in New York writing dialogue for soap operas, he made the leap into the action-packed world of television in Los Angeles, California. There he created an iconic TV character that to this day is the embodiment of creativity, resourcefulness, and resilience. And be aware, equipped with a gum and a paperclip, he can save the world. As an award-winning storyteller, creator, and visionary, he has inspired millions to think outside the box. He created a TV show that went over seven seasons with 139 episodes and two TV movies having been broadcast in over 70 countries. I'm more than happy to have him on the show today. He is simply the creator of MacGyver. Joining us live from Santa Fe, New Mexico, please welcome, give a big hand to Lee Slotov. Woo! Thank you, Ronnie. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. And today we'll not only dive here into the, one of the most iconic TV characters that ever came to life, but we will also tie into all the learnings and thinking outside the box, being resourceful, also being resilient, and also what you can take with you in your everyday life. But before we actually get into all of that, when you look at your life today, Lee, and think back at your journey, was that what you had imagined as a kid? <laughs> Well, I certainly didn't imagine this, you know, um, but I guess I was kind of always a storyteller and uh, somewhere along the line, uh, it became clear to me that that television was the medium uh, really of uh, information, culture and development in the world. And so when I was in college, I thought it might be interesting to go into television. I had obviously no idea that I would necessarily be successful or that I would create an iconic character that then became a word in the dictionary. I mean, you don't sit down and plan that. <laughs> it just sort of happens, but it happened to me. And I guess I couldn't be, I couldn't be more grateful and gratified that the character of MacGyver has spread around the world and become a global mem and, and encourages people every day to uh to see if they can solve the problems that they're facing so there you go oh that's very beautiful that's a very beautiful entry actually and a very beautiful start and we'll actually dig deeper now going back a little bit you already said you were in college you studied liberal arts in saint john's college in annapolis maryland and back then you were discussing philosophers like plato homer aristotle and and through that i i read that you learned to think outside the box. How did then actually, from the Greek philosophers, did you get into show business? Well, 
<laughs> I guess that's a good question, but but part of it was was there in my in in my first answer to you, which was, you know, we were reading the great books of the Western world. St. John's is a very unusual program. It's not like you have courses and you decide which courses you want to take. Everybody takes the same four year set course. Everybody reads the same books and 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 you discuss, you know, history, literature, philosophy, mathematics, science, language. Um, and it occurred to me while I was there, it's sort of like, OK, these are the great books that sort of form the basis of what we call Western culture. OK. And I thought about it and I said, well, where are the great books of the future going to come from? And it occurred to me that that might be television, not necessarily books. Um, and so I thought it might be interesting to go into television to see where our global cultural sort of progression would uh, would both come from and how it would develop. Um, and and because I've always kind of been a natural storyteller, I uh, I thought maybe if I could uh, if I could write that might be a, a good way into the business and um, it turned out that it was you know um, I so I wrote a screenplay when I was in college uh, found my way to New York got a job as a secretary on a before, sofa before opera. we get to, to that actually before we get to your to getting your job in New York. When you were when you were going through all those um, philosophers and those ancient books and and basically let's say the foundation of the Western world stories and, and and everything how it was already thousands of years ago brought down was this also something where you created your own ability to for storytelling where you saw maybe some patterns or this is how a great story is crafted or, or how did you learn your the, the skill of telling a story. So here, here was the interesting thing about that educational experience. Even though we were all reading the same books, the goal was to really come up with your own understanding of what those things meant. It wasn't, we, we didn't have professors because they didn't profess at us. We had what were called tutors. And since all the classes were seminars, you had to read the books and then you had to come to the seminar and have ideally something intelligent or interesting to say about it. And so one of the things you learned at that school was you learned to speak, you learned to listen, which is a rare skill these days, believe it or not. You learn to read carefully, you learn to write, and you learn to think for yourself because it wasn't about what everybody else said. It was about what did you think about this particular thing? You also learned how to ask questions. You discovered that asking the right question was somehow even more important than having the right answer. Because if you didn't ask the right question, it almost didn't matter what the answer was because it wasn't going to get you anywhere. But if you could ask the right question, that might open up a whole line of dialogue or inquiry that nobody else or you hadn't thought about. So, and obviously reading the great stories, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Dante, all these, you know, all these magnificent stories, you began to understand what made a story good. It needs a beginning, it needs a middle, it needs an end, but but really, what is the story about? Which is different than what happens. You know, young writers come to me all the time and they say, oh, I have a story. And I say, great. I said, what is it about? And they go, well, this guy does this and this. And I said, no, no, you're telling me what happens. What is the story about? Is this a redemption story? Is this a revenge story? Is this an aspirational story? You know, what is the story really about? And so I definitely learned that in school. Wow, that, that's fascinating, actually. Just piggybacking on that idea. Because stories are, are basically the medium how before we actually wrote down even things as humanity, we already were, were telling things generation to generation through stories. Why are stories so important? I mean, you have a great story and you have created many great stories. So on the one hand, why are stories so important? On the other hand, what makes a great story? Okay, so why are stories so important? The truth is, Ronnie that humans are a narrative species. And by that, I mean every other species we know of has some form of communication. Plants give off chemicals to communicate to other plants that there's a stressor in the situation. 
Every species we know of communicates. The only species we know of that tell stories are humans. Okay? And if you think about it, every experience we understand as humans is in story form. Why do you wear the clothes you wear? Why do you drive the car you drive? Okay, why do you take the job that you take? It Because it ultimately fits into a story. I mean, think about it for a second. There are 10,000 models of cars in the world. A car is four wheels and an engine. Okay, now it could be electric engine, but, you know, or a gas engine. But you need a little one, you need a bigger one, you need an even bigger one, you need a truck. We're done, aren't we? No. If you're going to spend so much money on a on a you know, on an item, you have to buy into a story. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Love is a Subaru. Ronnie, I am not an expert on love, but I'm pretty sure love is not a Subaru, okay? But but <laughs> you need to buy into a story. Why do you use an Android phone as opposed to, you know, a, 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 an, an iPhone? iPhone? We all do the same thing. Right. Oh, but I'm an Apple person. Well, no, I'm an Android person. What difference does it make? It's a story. Every religious experience, every spiritual experience, every relationship you enter into is a story. You think the story is going to go one way and then someday you wake up and you go, oh, this is the person I thought I was going to spend my life with, but it's not working out. The story has to change. So stories are important because, Ronnie, if you want to change anything either in the world or in yourself, the first thing you have to do is change the story. You get enough people to buy into a new story, you've changed the world. You buy into a new story for yourself, you can change yourself. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so you actually sold me the idea that stories are important. I was already sold before, but that, that even... Um, put the icing on the cake. What makes a great story? Well, what makes a great story is, is as I said, you sort of need a beginning, a middle, and an end. You begin with an expectation, and then, and then usually there's conflict in a story. There has to be drama. If everything goes exactly as it's supposed to go, it's not a very interesting story, you know. <laughs> You go, oh, here's a character, and suddenly this character is confronted with a difficult circumstance, okay? Uh, they're trapped, they're, they want to be in a relationship, but they haven't found the right person. Whatever it is, there's a conflict. And then how that conflict gets resolved is essentially the ending of the story. If you don't have a good conflict, there's no drama, And then there's nothing to hold somebody in the story. And it's very interesting, by the way, that we as human beings love fiction a whole lot more than we love nonfiction. Okay. On any given day on Amazon, 70% of the books that are purchased are fiction books. Only 30% are nonfiction. Okay. James Cameron made a movie called Titanic. It grossed. Two billion dollars. Okay. He also made a documentary about discovering the Titanic. It grows 17 million dollars. Okay. Fiction It's a bit is of a really difference. more powerful in some ways than truth, even with the same information. Why? Because if I say to you, once upon a time, you go, Ooh, I'm going to hear a story. I want to hear about it. If I say, I'm going to show you a documentary, And tell you the truth, you go, okay, well, now I got to sit here and think, if, do I agree with this? Do I disagree with this? It becomes a critical process, okay? The inconvenient truth that, uh, that Al Gore made about climate change. One of the most successful documentaries of all time grossed over $50 million. There was a fiction film called The Day After Tomorrow, which was also about climate change. It grossed $550 million. Why? Because we'd rather be in that fiction than have to be confronted by what we think are true facts. That's all. Oh, beautiful. Very beautiful. And thank you for, for laying out also all those hands-on examples that, that I believe also many people can relate to. So going back into your story, 
you graduated from college and then you went to New York and you became a writer for soap operas. How was yeah. that? I believe you did this for around a year. And also, what were your learnings along the way there? Right. So so I wrote a, a fiction script in, in college shortly after I graduated. I got to New York. I managed to get a job as a secretary on a soap opera. Eventually, I decided, you know, I didn't come here to be a secretary. And the producer came back late one night and I was working late and I said, look, I got nothing to lose here. We started talking and I said, you know, I think I could write this show better than it's being written. And he looked at me and he said, boy, that's a pretty ballsy thing for a secretary to say. And then he said, do you have anything to back that up? And I said, well, I have this script. So I gave him the script and I figured, look, he'll throw it in the garbage. Maybe he'll read a few pages. Maybe he'll just come in and fire me. I don't know. But I didn't come here to be a secretary, so I'll take my shot. He walked in the next morning. He pointed at me and he said, you, in my office, right now. And I thought, oh, man, if you're going to fire me, you could just fire me right here. I walk in his office. He said, close the door, sit down. Said, okay, close the door, sit down. He looks at me and he says, I read your script last night. You got a job as a writer. Boom. That's how I got my first job. <laughs> and then I was fired as the secretary of the soap opera, but it didn't matter because now I was writing for the soap opera. So. Wow. I actually want one thing that I would like to, to point out here, because oftentimes it's, we, we believe that we, or, or some people believe that you need to nail it on the first try. Basically your first job, I'm only going to do what I really want to do. And, and you didn't want to be a secretary, but you brought yourself in the vicinity. You brought yourself in, in the proximity of, of the people that would make those decisions. And through actually being in, in the proximity and having their ear and, and also on the one hand learning, but also then saying, what, how can I make this better? That's the way how you then put yourself in the game, isn't it? Yes. You need to, I mean, if you want to do a specific thing, you need to, A, Ideally, find people who are doing that thing and say to them, how is it you do this thing? Because if somebody's doing it, it means they had to learn how to do it. Well, if they had to learn how to do it, presumably you could learn how to do it. Okay. And so, all right, if it's learnable, what do I need to learn in order to, to do this job? And what I say to people in who come to me, and this is true about not only the entertainment industry, but there are sort of three, I call them the three and a half secrets. Okay. Number one, you got to believe in your bones that you are going to see succeed or you shouldn't be doing it. Okay. You know, I don't quote Yoda a lot, but there is, there is do and there is do not, there is no try. Okay. So you got to believe that I had to believe that I was going to succeed in the entertainment business or it was not the right business to be in. And then you have to do your homework. You, you have to do what it is you want to do. So I was writing. I wrote a script. I struggled with how do you tell a story, what's the beginning, what's the middle, so forth and so on. Okay. And then you have to not worry about how it's going to happen. This sounds crazy, but you have to let go of exactly the details of how it's going to happen. I mean, we've all watched endless, you know, late night talk shows and the the host always says to the guests, well, how, how did this, how did you succeed? How did it happen? What was your big break? And they always start with, you know, it's the craziest story. Okay. I met this person and they had nothing to do with the entertainment business, but they were married to some, I mean, you know, the stories sound crazy. How did they get from here to there? They almost always, they never say, oh, I knew exactly how it was going to work. I did this, I did this, I did this, and it all worked perfectly. It doesn't work that way. So you need to believe you're going to make it. You need to do the homework necessary so when the opportunity presents itself, you're ready to take advantage of it. And the third thing is you have to let go of the expectation of how it's going to happen because you don't control that. Okay, you just control what you do. And then the Beautiful. and a half, the half secret is 
you got to be part of the universe, okay? You can be a brilliant writer. If you go sit on a mountaintop and nobody reads what you write, it's never going to get out into the world. As you said, you have to put yourself in a situation where you can connect to the people who are doing what it is you want to do. And then sooner or later, you're doing what you want to do. Eventually, somebody is going to pay you to do what it is you're doing. And the next thing you know, you got a job and you're there. You also fail. Wow. You know? <laughs> of course, of course, because uh, we're, we're going to get into that in, in just a moment, actually. You, were, you did this for about a year, uh, writing soap operas. And, and yes. um, what I read was then you decided, okay, I'm, there, there's got to be something else besides learning how to write dialogue, which is well, what you took with you as well. And you moved across the country. You went to from New York to Los Angeles, and there you you thought, okay, I'm I'm gonna do more on TV. Or, or how was that? And also, how were the early struggles? Because it was not like, hey, I'm here and everybody's just lining up to get you signed. Um. So my wife and I at the time we were talking about having children. I, I did not want to try and raise children in New York city for a whole variety of reasons. So that meant we were going to move to a suburb and I went, well, if we're moving to a suburb, we might as well move to Los Angeles. There are going to be more opportunities for a writer like me in Los Angeles than there were in New York, even though I had been writing for a soap opera in New York. I knew no one in, in California. I, I mean, we, I knew no one, virtually no one in the business. Okay. And my wife said, well, how is, how are we going to succeed if you don't know anybody? I said, well, we hardly knew anybody in New York. So, you know, you just have to believe. So we got out there and of course I had things to write and you start to, uh, you know, you look for whatever opportunities you can. And one of the first jobs I got when I was in LA was as a script reader. So I would be given a script and my job was to, you know, because producers are given scripts all day long. And they don't have time to read every script. So they often go out to a service and say, okay, I got paid per script to read the script, write a synopsis, and then generally write, you know, did I think it had commercial appeal? Okay. That was a great, a great first job to have because the vast majority of the stuff I read was terrible. I mean, really terrible. And you went, my God, I could do better than this on my worst day. So it was, it was very encouraging. Okay. In that, in that I had no idea that, that so, there was so much bad writing out there. <laughs> and But also uh, tying back actually to, to your college days when you were learning from Plato, from Aristotle and, and from, from all those greats, but you learned some structure. And here also you learned on the one hand, you saw what's out there. You, you got to learn the market. And also you got to learn how not to do things and pr probably also some pinnacles in there where you said, or some pearls where you said, well, this is actually quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. So, so one of the great things my college education gave me was it, it taught you how to learn anything. Okay. Because, because you were confronted with this book and you're told this is a great book. It has stood the test of time and you had to read it and say, why, why is this a great book? What, what is, you know, you're banging your head against these things. And believe me, you know, you read some of those philosophers like Immanuel Kant and, you know, it's four pages before you get to a verb, you know, it's kind of like you really, this is not easy stuff. So you look then at any given situation you're in and you go, what really makes this whole world tick? What, how does the entertainment business really work? And there's the way it looks like it works. And then there's the way it really works. And by looking at the way it really worked, which was, turns out, secretaries and assistants were really crucial because they were the gatekeepers. And so I would befriend the secretaries and the assistants. I'd stop by, I'd, I'd call them up and I'd say, listen, I'm a writer. And they go, oh, well, we don't, we don't accept that. I said, I'm not, I'm not asking to you, for you to give this to your boss. You're, you sit in that chair all day and I know you have to read scripts. Would you be willing to read my script and tell me if it's any good? And I'd bring him a cup of coffee or I'd bring him a muffin. And, and so I got to know lots and lots of assistants and secretaries and gatekeepers. And lo and behold, they would read 
eventually some of them would read my stuff and go, you know, this is really good. I read scripts all day and most of them are terrible. <laughs> Yours is pretty good. And so I'd say, well, if you think it's good enough to share with your boss, that would be great. And so I just kind of networked until opportunities began to present themselves. And lo and behold, in the same week, I was offered uh, writing jobs on two different television series. And I had to make a choice. And the good news was I made a choice. And suddenly I was a paid writer. So just just actually before we get into that, and it's, it's brilliant because I just want everybody to get your strategy because you mentioned networking to really to build a network and to really define how is whatever industry you want to get into, who are the gatekeepers? Who are the people who are actually pulling the strings in the back and, and uh, defining the secretaries or, or the people who, who you need to get to in order to get to the people who then make the decision? But there is always right. somebody up yeah. front. And, and that's always, brilliant. So, so Yes, there's always a gatekeeper, okay? <laughs> and if you think of it as a story, you go, well, I'm not going to get to see the king or the dragon or whoever it was unless I get past the gatekeeper. So why don't I just sort of focus my attention and energy on who the gatekeepers are? And maybe one of them will lead me to the king or the dragon, or eventually the gatekeepers get promoted, you know, and they're the people who are then sitting in the king's chair. And so you knew a gatekeeper and you treated them with respect when they were just an assistant or a secretary or whatever. And they went, you know, I remember that guy. He treated me with respect. He didn't treat me like a doormat. And his writing was really good. Let me find out what's happening with him. And I'd get a call or my agent would get a call and say, hey, is Lee available? Is Lee busy? And the next thing I know, I walk in and I go, oh, my God, look at the job you have. And they go, yeah, sit down. I want to do something with you. Crazy, but there wow. you go. And at some point, of course, you get more influential and so on. And then, then you might actually know some kings in, to stay in, in this uh, paraphrase and, and then of course it's easier to get connected from one to the other but in the beginning to build a network you really need to go to the gatekeepers and to to make your way up so so you got your first let's say a contract or, or paid job as a staff writer right yeah what what does a staff writer do it basically is you produce episodes of shows right yeah so my job was to to write episodes for television shows. I was what was called an episodic writer. Those were dramas. So they're kind of like little movies every week as opposed to sitcoms, which are like little plays every week, more or less. I mean, it's changed a little bit, but that's basically the way it was broken down. And, and I discovered in that process, you know, I had to write, produce an enormous amount of creative material under relentless deadlines because, you know, once they turned on that production machine, they were not going to turn it off because they're paying, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. And if they have to shut down for a day because the script isn't ready, they still have to pay those people. You know, they can't just send them home and say, oh, well, you know, we're not paying you today. You go, the hell you're not paying me today. I'm on, you know, I'm on payroll here. So, and I discovered in that process, that the real, quote unquote, creative writer within me was not my conscious mind, it was my subconscious mind. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. It turned out that when I was stressed and pressured to write stuff, the best stuff came to me when I was either driving or taking a shower, not when I was sitting at my typewriter, because believe it, this is even predating computers, okay? back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, all right? And, and I went, wait a minute, from St. John's, I said, ask the question, why is it that the best stuff keeps coming to you when you're either driving or taking a shower, not when you're, quote, unquote, trying to be creative? And it turned out that we think that the conscious mind is really where it's at because we're awake three quarters or more of the day, all right. You wake up in the morning and I call it the hamster wheel. That hamster wheel of thoughts starts going all day long. OK. And it doesn't stop until you finally run out of energy and put your head down on the pillow and fall asleep. Turns out your subconscious mind goes 24 seven and your subconscious mind has been with you 
since probably before you were born. You know how your heartbeat starts when it's in the womb? It doesn't heartbeat doesn't start the moment you you come out of the you know the womb. Your heartbeat starts early. I would be willing to bet your subconscious starts early. And Ronnie, your subconscious has recorded everything that's ever happened to you. It is like a massive data bank, okay? Now, because we're awake three quarters of the day, we think, oh, our conscious mind, this is where our consciousness really is. And that subconscious thing, maybe we remember a dream or something. We got it backwards, okay? The subconscious is massive. It's huge, okay? So if the conscious mind is this mug of coffee, the subconscious mind is the entire state of New Mexico that I live in. Those are the real proportions. And so I learned that my subconscious was a much, much better creative force than my conscious mind. And in fact, if I could get my conscious mind out of the process, it was even better. I've subsequently written a book about this called The MacGyver Secret, Connect to Your Inner MacGyver and Solve anything. Because the answers we are really looking for, whether they're in our work, whether they're our relationships, whether they're creative or technical, those answers are already inside of you. You just have to know how to get to them. And the MacGyver secret requires nothing more than a pen and a piece of paper. And you can establish a dialogue with your inner MacGyver, subconscious, higher self, really doesn't matter what you call it. I know one guy who called it his big purple Jesus. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it is that part of you that knows you better than anyone else ever will and knows all of the information that you've ever gathered and can use it when you have a question or a problem. And so mm -hmm. I developed this very simple method of writing down the question turning it over to my subconscious, not thinking about it, working on something, you know, what we call an incubation activity. I built paper models. I put a work, I put a workbench in my office. I had a whiteboard and a workbench and my typewriter, okay? And I would go to the board and say, I need an idea for an episode. Instead of standing there and racking my brain for an idea for an episode, I would then go sit at that workbench and I built paper models. Build the Empire State Building out of paper. Build the Taj Mahal out of paper. Build the Vatican out of paper. I mean, who needs a Vatican made out of paper? Nobody does. But it did the same thing that driving and taking a shower did. It focused my conscious mind on something else so that my subconscious mind could work on the problem. And then after 45 minutes or an hour, I would go to the whiteboard and I would say, what do you have for me? And I just start writing. It didn't matter what I wrote. I could write, Mary had a little lamb. I could write what I wanted for lunch. Just literally start the act of writing. And within 30 to 60 seconds, the ideas just flowed out of me. And it was like, oh, yeah, of course, he could do that. And she could do this. And this could happen. And then that could happen. And the material was just there. So I became very adept at turning out good material very quickly. And so I rose in the industry very, very fast. I went from being a freelance writer to being essentially, a, you know, a pilot writer in like two and a half years. And MacGyver wow. was the first pilot. So, so we, we, before we, uh, yeah, before we actually get into that, because, um, sure. so yes, freelance writer, staff writer, and then a pilot writer. Pilot basically is, um, for a new show to create the, the pilot episode, like the test episode in a way. And there was one afternoon you got a call from your agent, Marty, that basically changed your life. How was that? Yep. Take us with you. Okay. So I had been working on, on a series and, and I was getting, even though I had this great technique, I was getting a little burned out. And I said, you know what? I'm coming here and, and giving my best stuff to people who don't really care about me. And at that point, I had a, you know, a wife and two children. And I said, I'm going home and they're getting the worst part of me. I said, this is backwards. So I just quit. I just said, 
I'm not going to, I'm going to stop for a while. I'm just going to regroup and rethink this whole thing. And, and, you know, nobody leaves a staff job <laughs> from a television series. It's very, you know, you get paid a lot of money and there's status and, and no one, no one in the, the show or in the company believes, they went, what do you mean you're quitting? I went, I'm not happy. I know I can do this job, but it's not fulfilling me. I got to figure out something else. And I quit. And of course, by then, you know, I had a lawyer, uh, an agent, a business manager. And initially, they all went, oh, great, Lee, we're all behind you. You know, you take care of yourself. But of course, after a certain number of months, they go, hey, you're not making us any money here, buddy, because we only make money when you make money. So my agent came to me. This must have been six months after I had just sort of gone off on my own. And he said, listen, I got a job for you. I said, Marty, we've been through this. He said, no, no, just listen to me. I got you a job writing a pilot, and I got you more money for somebody who has never written a pilot before. And I went, what are you talking about? He said, well, you kept saying no. That's when I learned that the more I said no, the higher my price went. I wasn't trying to raise my price, Ronnie. I just didn't want to keep doing it. But every time a project came my way and Marty called me and I said, no, the price went up. And he said, Lee, I have got you. More. I said, well, what is the project? He said, who cares what the project is? I told you, I just got you more money for somebody who's never written a pilot before than the history of television. you got to do this for me. I will come to your office. I will get on my knees. I will beg. I went, all right, well, what is it? He said, well, it's this new concept, okay? And, and they said it's never been done before. You don't have to pitch it. It's already been sold to ABC. Henry Winkler's company and Paramount have sold the show. You go in, you write it, you're in, you're out. Please, I'm begging you. I said, okay, Marty, fine. I'll go ahead, say yes, I'll take the job. All right, great. So I take the job. And I go in and I meet with them. And they say, this is a brand new concept that's never been done before. And I went, wow, this sounds great. What is it? And so they tell me the concept. And I listen and I ask a couple of questions and and then I'm in this very awkward situation and they go, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, guys, there's a reason it's never been done before. And they said, what's that? I said, it's not going to work. And they went, what do you mean? Everybody loved it. I mean, the network loved it. We love it. What do you mean it's not going to work? And I went, well, I explained to them that it sounds great when you say it, but but since I'm the guy that's being hired to actually do it, I ha I kind of have to tell you what's going to happen. And, and just to give little... a little context around that, because the, the concept it was original. Just to give a little context around that, it was the concept. It was originally called the Hourglass. Yes, the concept right? was called Basically. Hourglass, and and what it was was one hour of real time was going to be one hour of television time. So in other words, you were watching. 45 minutes in essentially in real time, which which is so the question I asked is, oh, is this a serial? Do all these hours, you know, each hour kind of build a bigger story? They said, no, they all have to be standalone episodes. There was a very successful show called 24, which did exactly that. But but every show was one hour out of uh, ultimately the day that would change the world. Right. And they said, hours, no, yeah. it's not a serial. Each show has to be has to have a beginning, a middle, and end. It's got to be a complete story. And I said, well, but you're giving away what television and film is is brilliant about, which is we can skip space and time. You know, you can be in New York, and then you can see a shot of a plane, and now you're in, you know, Beijing, all right? You, you can't do that on this show because we, we, we're tied to that clock. And they went, oh, well... So what does that mean? And I said, it means every show is going to have to begin where it ends. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't want to see our character traveling. That's not interesting. We want to see the character doing something, right? Yeah. I said, well, you got the sinking submarine show. You got the locked bank vault show. You got the mine shaft show. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to, you're, you're limiting your choices here. And I don't think this show is going to survive. I could write that pilot. It's one episode. But then what are you going to do 
you know, three years from now. You can't keep boxing the character into something that tight. And they went, oh, boy, wow, we didn't think of that. I said, I'm sorry. You know what? I don't need to take this job. It's okay. And they went, no, no, you're not going anywhere. We just agreed to pay you more money than anybody who's never written a pilot before. So you got to fix this. I went, oh, okay. So I came up with one idea. Network didn't like it. Came up with another idea. Network didn't like that either. Came up with a third idea. Network hated it. So I did what every self-respecting Hollywood writer does. I called my agent and I whined. And I said, Marty, you told me I was just going to be in and out. Write this and I could be pitching this for the rest of my life. He said, well, what do you want from me? You're the one who told them their idea wouldn't work. And I went, you know what? You're right. So I got all my writer friends into a room. I said, I need your help. Locked the door. I had every potential inebriant someone could want. And I said, we're not leaving this room till I have a kick-ass idea to get me out of this deal. And I told them everything I had tried. Say, well, what do you have? I said, I have nothing. That's why you're here. I have absolutely nothing. I'm blank. I'm dead. I got nothing. And there was a long pause. And one of my friends, I honestly don't remember who it was, said, great, let's go with that. I said, let's go with what? They said, let's go with nothing. I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, look, James Bond, you know, he always gets those toys from Q at the beginning of every movie, right? Indiana Jones, he's got the hat and the gun and the whip. What if your guy, Lee, he goes into a situation and he's got nothing? And there was another long pause and I went, that's it. That's, that's, that's genius. Our guy has nothing. He has to figure it out as he goes. He has to make it up as he goes along. He has to find it on the fly. And that's the hook. Every show, he shows up. You know he doesn't have anything except a bag to put stuff in. Okay? And he's got to make something out of nothing, which is exactly what we just did in the room. I said, great. And then they said, we were saying, our guy, our guy. And they said, okay, what are you going to call this character, Lee? And I said, well, we'll just call him Guy. And they went, nah, 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 that's too on the nose. And I went, okay, well, in those days, McDonald's, the hamburger chain, was blossoming. And they were putting on their, on their restaurants 50 million sold, 100 million sold. They eventually stopped doing that, I think, because they thought people would figure out, how many cows is 100 million hamburgers, you know? <laughs> they stopped. All right. But anything that was wildly popular got a Mac in front of it. USA Today, the newspaper came out. It was called McNewspaper. So I said, hey, why don't we just call him Mac Guy? And they went, man, it needs to be three syllables, Lee. So, oh, okay. Maguy, Maguy. How about MacGyver? All right. It's like that's kind of Scottish name there, frugal and flinty people, you know, and they went MacGyver. Yeah, we like the sound of that. That's how MacGyver was born. <laughs> and even uh, the, the, not a lot of people know that it, it's actually Angus MacGyver, which even is, is even more Scottish. Yes. Well, the, the first I, name. I, think I gave him a, a, I think I originally called him Stace, and, but everybody just called him Mac. And then at some point when the show was running, they said, let's call him, let's give him the first name of Angus. And, okay, I don't care what you call him, you know. I mean, at that point, I, I, listen, I wrote that pilot in record time. I mean, I, once I thought, oh, I, I pitched the idea. They went, oh, that sounds interesting. I went home. I swear to God, I think I wrote that pilot in 10 days or less because it's like, man, I don't want them to change their minds because I'm done pitching this thing. So I blasted through that, that pilot. They read it, and the next thing I heard was, we're making the show. I went, what? So there you go. <laughs> wow. So um, how was that then? Because you actually didn't continue with, with writing all the episodes. So did you just write the pilot, or did you also write some other episodes? And also, how was that feeling for you then when you saw what actually grew out of MacGyver? Did you, did you watch all the episodes? Was there a favorite episode? How was that for you then to see this evolve, this... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, 
they asked me if I wanted to stay with the series, and for a variety of reasons, I didn't want to stay with the series, and I, I appreciated the offer. So literally, Ronnie, all I wrote was the pilot. I wrote the first episode of MacGyver. And this show became a hit because of Richard Dean Anderson, the writers, the producers, the actors. I mean, they did a great job. It was not, you know, it was not high-end classical TV. It was, it was an action-adventure show, okay? But that concept of figuring it out on the fly, okay, really, and I, 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 I took away the gun, not be, from some moral thing. I took away the gun, I said, because if he doesn't have a gun, he's going to have to figure out another way to solve the problem. It's not just shooting back. You know, we've all seen the movies where the bad guys have machine guns, brrr, and the good guy has a pistol, boom, 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 and they all die, you know? And it's like, wait a minute, come on, you know? It's like, so if we took away the gun, he had a Swiss Army knife, he got some duct tape, okay? And the answer was, he couldn't shoot back, all right? It wasn't about guns, it was about using his brain, all right? So, so the show goes on, and the next thing I know, it's it it's running year after year, and then I learned that it's been sold all over the world. Okay, and at one point I I made a, a pilot TV movie in Tunisia, of all places. Okay, and a Tunisian TV crew shows up and says, uh, "Well, what else have you done?" And I said, "Well, I wrote the show MacGyver." <gasps> you created MacGyver. And I said, yeah, why? What, what's the big? They went, you don't understand. This country stops when that show is on. I said, you're kidding me. They said, no, no. It turns out the same was true in South America. The same was true in some of the Norwegian countries. The same was true in some Asian countries. The same was true in Europe. The world would just stop when MacGyver was on. After that interview, I would walk down the street in Tunisia. Men would come out of their shops to shake my hand. Women would come up to me on the street with children and say, kiss this man. I said, what are you talking about? It's a television show. He said, it's MacGyver. Okay, it's MacGyver. It was like sacred to them. And I'm going, what is this? So here's how I think about that now that I've had some time to think about it. It's like, look. You have a child, the child grows up and does something wonderful. Are you proud of them? Of course you're proud of them. It's your child. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it, Ronnie. Okay. I gave them a blueprint. Okay. I gave them, you know, the outline, so to speak. But I didn't make MacGyver a phenomenon. The world did. They embraced his character because they said, you know what? He does what we do every day to survive, because most people in the world don't have all the advantages and privileges that we have in the West. It's, it's better now than it used to be, but, you know, back in the, in the 80s, you know, there were a lot of second and third world countries, and they went, we identify with this character. Number one, he doesn't use a gun. We don't have guns, okay? Lo yes, we love Rambo, and we love James Bond, but, but, this guy is like us, okay? He figures it out. Number two, MacGyver was kind of, he always had a sense of humor and humility, okay? He, he was always the smartest guy in the room. He never acted like the smartest guy in the room. He wasn't putting other people down. He just went, everybody else went, oh, my God, we're all going to die. He goes, wait a minute. Let's just take a step back and think about what we got, and maybe there's a way to figure this out, and we can all survive. So MacGyver is a child of mine, but I don't take credit for what it became because it grew up and did it all by itself. I just happened to be the father. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. And there are on, on your website, MacGyver.com, there is actually, it says there is a MacGyver in everyone and anyone can be MacGyver. On the one hand, what does that mean? And on the other hand, how much... Lee is in MacGyver, and also how much MacGyver is in Lee? Ooh, okay. Well, MacGyver was a creation of mine. So it's asking, you know, as I said from my college days, MacGyver goes, 
looks around and says, what do I have? What are the resources available to me in this situation? Okay. And obviously, if your listeners or viewers want to go to MacGyver.com, there's lots of stuff to see there. We do lots of different projects. We have a MacGyver Foundation. We do, you know, philanthropic projects, all kinds of stuff. There's a new MacGyver fiction series that we're doing, sort of picks them up. I've turned MacGyver into a musical, believe it or not. So, you know, there's there's lots of ways this character continues to grow and expand. But we are facing numerous crises right now on this planet, Roddy. I'm not the first person to be telling you that, okay? We all know that. The truth is we have resources both inside of us and around us that we can use to deal with the problems we all face. So there's a MacGyver in everyone, and anyone can be MacGyver is a way of saying he's not just a television character. He's you, okay? You have resources inside of yourself, i.e. in the MacGyver secret, how to connect your inner MacGyver and solve anything. And there are probably resources around you that you can use to deal with whatever crisis you're facing. We all are MacGyvers now. We're all going to have to take responsibility because if we wait for the leaders of this planet to fix things, it's never going to get fixed. We're going to have to fix it. We made this mess. We can clean this mess up. We have all the technology we need to fix things. We don't need new technologies. We just need to take responsibility for what's going on in this planet right now and look inside ourselves and look around us and say, what is it going to take for me to make the world a better place? And we can do that. Wow. Or we can tear ourselves apart in endless wars and other destructive behaviors. And that'll be it for civilization, you know? Wow. Very, very uh, deep and insightful as well. As our time is slowly coming to an end, just to shift gears a little bit. If there would be one character trait or one gadget, I know MacGyver didn't have a lot of gadgets, but what, something from MacGyver that you would like to have in real life, what would it be? Who? Well, the Swiss Army knife is a pretty good start. <laughs> Why? Because it's a multi-tool. So whether it's a leather man or a Swiss Army knife, but, but think of yourself as a multi-tool. Maybe you can only do one thing, but chances are, most human beings can do a lot of different things, okay? Some robots can, but most robots can pretty much do one thing. Oh, I'm a robot that vacuums the floor, okay? Or I'm a robot that can walk upstairs. Oh, well, can you tell me a story? Oh, no, I don't do that. You know, I'm just a robot that walks upstairs. Well, guess what? Humans can walk upstairs, most of us, and tell stories and vacuum the floor. You know, we are multi-tools. So, so if you think of Maybe yourself, at the same time. I'm sorry? <laughs> Maybe even at the same time, going Maybe upstairs with the back Or and sing a song. It's amazing. But there you go. Okay? So think of yourself. I try to think of myself as that Swiss Army knife, that multi-tool. There are lots of different blades and tools in there. What, are, what tool am I going to use to deal with this situation? What's the smart way to do it? And taking time to stop and think about that as opposed to just reacting to everything, sometimes is the best way to proceed. So sometimes being quiet and looking at a situation rather than simply reacting to a situation is the best way to deal with it. So multi-tool. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's great. Uh, what's one thing of advice that you would like to give somebody who is either just starting out on that journey or who is on a crossroad and, and would like to follow his or her passion, but is not really sure of, of can they really do it? Sure. And this is going to sound a little crazy and controversial. I believe that everything you want is already inside of you. We tend to think it's out there and we have to go out and get it. That's the old, you know, sort of hunter-gatherer mentality. It's out there. I have to chase it down. I have to kill it. I have to skin it. I got to put it over my shoulder and try and get it back to the cave before some other animal takes it away from me. We don't live that way, most of us, anymore. I understand 
if you're struggling to eat or keep a roof over your head or clothes on your body, that's a different circumstance. But the vast majority of the world does not spend its time hunting for food. Okay? So, if you want something in the world, find it in yourself first. And then, more likely than not, it will show up. The thing you want will show up. But it's not really out there. It's really inside of you. And then you say, well, how do I find it inside of me? Well, I don't know. Go read The MacGyver's Secret. Maybe that'll help. But, but what I'm saying is switch the story. The story is what you want is not outside, away from you somewhere else. It's already inside of you. Find it inside of you, and then it will appear in the world, and you can have what you want. That's very, very beautiful. If somebody would like to know more about you or, or somehow get in contact, what's the best way? Where can they find out more? Uh, MacGyver.com is the best way. You know, there are there are people on the site. If you want to reach out to me, you can, you know, go to info, I think, at MacGyver.com and, and tell us what you're looking for and whatever it is. But the website, MacGyver.com, is the best way to both see what's going on in the world of MacGyver and to get in touch with me. Very, very beautiful. Any last 30-second thought that you would like to leave us with? 30-second thought. We can fix the world. It is not hopeless. It is not over. If we can deal with something like COVID and come up with multiple effective vaccines in one year, we can fix the world. It's doable. Believe it and live it. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your wisdom, for your insights, for sharing your story with us and also for having inspired millions and millions of people around the world. Thank you once again. A big hand to Lee Slotov. Woo! Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for sticking with us until the end. To make this content even more valuable for you, please leave a comment below and share your thoughts and also share this video with somebody you care about who absolutely needs to see this. Thank you very much. Have an outstanding day and see you next time.